Um, greetings, my name is Helen Blyer. I have the privilege of serving this community as the Director of Continuing Education. Um, I was told I could still say that I'm new because it's not quite um, um, 18 months that I've been here. It's actually just about 13 months that I've been here. So I, I still count as new. Um, this is our second lecture in the W. Don McClure Lectures in World Mission and Evangelism. It marks our 31st year of offering these lectures, named in honor of Don McClure, who is a longtime missionary in Ethiopia and the Sudan, as well as being a member of the PTS class of 1934. Um, our own P.C. Rawson Professor Emeritus of Church History, Charles Parti, wrote a history of Don McClure's walk called Adventure in Africa. And as I announced at our other lecture, it's available on Amazon for your Kindle. So you can download a copy of this um, biography. At this time, we would like to present our guest, Dan Dr. Daniel Jayaraj, a copy of Don McClure's autobiography, which has, I think, the best autobiography title I've ever seen. It's Red-Headed, Rash, and Religious. <laughs> and it's a collection of Don's letters um, as a pioneer missionary in the Horn of Africa. We'd also like to present him with a coin. It's a silver proof coin bearing the likeness of His Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie on the occasion of Haile Selassie's 80th birthday and 55th year as emperor. So Daniel, we would like to present these to you as a small token of our gratitude for you joining us here for the lectures. I'd like to point out as well the members of the McClure family in attendance. We have uh, Don McClure's son-in-law and retired professor emeritus of church history, Charles Partee, in the back, along with his grandson, Jonathan Partee, and three fabulous great-grandchildren back there, Rebecca, Elizabeth, and Abigail, and Jonathan's wife, Sarah, I will be calling up to the podium to do a short presentation on Don McClure's wife, Lida. Um, the Horn of Africa does seem to have this siren call to the members of the McClure family. I'm delighted to introduce Sarah, who is the granddaughter of Don McClure, and she and her husband, Jonathan, both served in Ethiopia for two years and learned how to speak Amharic, and Sarah herself went back to that land to teach English not that long ago for a month. So Sarah, I'd like to invite you to the podium to do your presentation. Good evening. These lectures are um, to honor Reverend Dr. W. Don McClure and his contribution to missions in East Africa. Tonight, I would like to specifically honor his wife and life partner, Lida Boyd McClure. They met while short-term missionaries in Sudan and later married. They are the embodiment of the expression, two peas in one pod, as they were famous for sleeping in the same sleeping bag all across Africa. <laughs> Lida Boyd, a dark-haired, dark-eyed graduate of Muskingum College, was teaching mathematics in Wheeling, West Virginia, when she applied for short-term service in Egypt. In the summer of 1929, she was asked to teach in Sudan, but had to decline because she had just signed a new teaching contract for the upcoming year. A Sudan missionary wrote her a letter imploring her to reconsider. Lida asked the president of the Wheeling School Board for a three-year leave of absence, and 12 days later, boarded a ship for Africa where she would spend the majority of her life. In that 12 days, between when she accepted her first call to mission and she boarded the ship. There was a picnic held in her honor. 
At this picnic, according to the family story, a spider ran across her sandwich. <laughs> she was too disgusted to eat any of it. Then she got on a boat where she would spend the next 50 years in Africa, many of them in a mud hut with lions in the yard, scorpions in the roof, serpents on the floor, and weevils in the flower. <laughs> the first time I was to meet Lida, I was very anxious and prepared myself to meet an enormous, hulking Amazon warrior as befitting the stories of strength and courage that I had heard. I was shocked to find myself face to face with a humble, unassuming, five foot two, 95 pound woman. She was gracious and kind as she always was and showed me some crocheting that she had been working on because she said crocheting kept her hands busy and she always traveled with her crocheting in Ethiopia for just that purpose. For example, one time she and Don were heading into town for supplies when the truck broke down. Not having the necessary parts in the truck, Don walked into town, leaving Lida to keep watch over the vehicle. To pass the time, she crocheted, but was always disappointed that she was never able to wash the road dust out of the two tablecloths she finished. <laughs> And I said, wow, you must be really fast <laughs> to complete two entire tablecloths. She nonchalantly replied, no, Don was gone for six days. <laughs> In 1960, at age 54, 10 years away from retirement, Don had to finish his assignment as administrator of the mission in Addis Ababa and open a mission station on the banks of the remote Gilo River in rural Ethiopia. Therefore, Lida set out on a river journey with 12 Anuak tribesmen. The mouth of the Gilo River was so overgrown that after six hours of hacking down grass and pulling the boats forward, they only covered 30 yards. Seeing the futility of this approach, Lida decided to walk. 65 miles through crocodile and leech infested swamps in water up to her armpits, followed by walking through grassland with grasses 15 feet high and populated by hunting leopards. After the first day, the Anuak tribesmen went on strike, saying that their burdens were too heavy. They refused to go any farther unless they were paid more money than Don had promised and they had agreed to. So Lida simply fired them all, walked by herself to the next village, and hired more carriers. <laughs> she and this new group of Anuak tribesmen arrived at the Gilo Mission Station location after dark to the cries of the colobus monkeys, the barking of the baboons, and the chirping of nocturnal insects. Everyone and everything arrived safely after three and a half days of walking. Don would later joke that most missionary husbands went deep into the bush, hacked a mission station out of the jungle, and then sent for their wives. He found it far more convenient to send his wife first. <laughs> and when the station was ready, he would join her. <laughs> I 
Lyda McClure was a tough and competent missionary woman, the equal of any man on the field. And she showed her radical feminism through bravery, hospitality, humility, and eschewing material comforts. Lyda would agree that her journey from uneaten spider trod sandwich to hacking a mission station by hand out of the jungle was a result of being molded by the master's hand. She spent her life as a keen edged tool in the kingdom of God and is an inspiration to Christians everywhere. There is hope for us too if we allow our lives to be molded the way that Lida did. Amen. Thank you, Sarah. A few short announcements before we begin. Our academic vice president, Reverend Dr. Barry Jackson, and our president, Reverend Dr. Bill Carl, send their deep regrets for not being here, as they were both called to serve by one of our uh, accreditation bodies and could not be with us this evening. They're sorry that they couldn't be here to greet you. Our lecture series closes tomorrow with 11.30 chapel, and Dr. Jaya Raj will be preaching on transcending boundaries with the risen Lord Jesus Christ, preaching on First Letter Corinthians chapter 15. An informal reception will follow this lecture upstairs in the foyer, and we do welcome you to join us and interact more informally with our presenters this evening. We want to make sure that you're aware of our upcoming continuing education events and help yourselves to calendars and other materials. And this coming Thursday, continuing our theme of globalization, the ethicist Rebecca Todd Peters will be speaking on solidarity ethics and living justly in the developed world in solidarity with the poor in developing nations. A reminder, too, that we'll be making DVDs of these lectures and potentially related resources for adult education. Stay in touch with us so you can find out what develops from this. There are two good people I'd like to introduce to you. The first is going to be um, our co-presenter, Reverend Mike Gerling, who will be joining Daniel on stage. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to get to know Michael these past months. He currently serves in multiple capacities. I'm wondering how many hats you wear sometimes, Mike. Um, he serves as InterVarsity Christian Fellowship Director of International Graduate and Faculty Persons. He provides leadership to InterVarsity's ministry among international students and scholars at the major research universities across the country. He serves as co-pastor with our church planting coordinator, Chris Brown, of The Upper Room, a recently chartered PCUSA church here in Pittsburgh. He offers leadership in the PCUSA's 1001 New Worshiping Communities Movement and is happily one of our own graduates, having graduated from PTS in 2008. So Mike will be joining um, Daniel on stage after Daniel finishes his presentation. And of course, the real star of the show, Daniel J. Araj. Dr. J. Araj is, has been just a delight to work with in preparation for this event. Um, he has a primary professional interest in the dynamics of Christian engagement with people of other cultures and religions, and I think you will find his understanding of what it means to be missional to be quite thought-provoking and radical. Since 1990, he has studied the legacy of European missionaries and Indian Christians, and he is currently serving at Liverpool Hope University as the director of the Andrew F. Walls Center. I won't take up any more time from his presentation, except to say, Daniel, we're very grateful to have you with us. Good evening, uh, everyone. It's really a joy to be with you this evening. And many hearty thanks to Bishop Darcy McConnell, who just arrived from Philippines. Thank you for taking the trouble to be with us. He was my pastor.
for uh, s several years. And many great thanks to also Dr. Sharon Taylor and the World Mission Initiative colleagues and for the seminary for inviting me to share with you these, some of the thoughts on engaging with God and the gospel cross-culturally. A theme that has been very close to my heart for a very, very long time. And how the, what does it mean to be in the body of Christ in, in mission and in witness and service? So this particular lecture it follows what we, where we left earlier, discovering God's word among people of other faiths. And there we consider a little bit about Sanskrit writings and how Christians met with this background and created God's word in different languages. When I use the word created, it is helping the local people to understand God's word that was revealed in Hebrew or in Greek or in Aramaic. And in the course of time, they discovered themselves and several other things. So it follows. What is the result? What is the impact of that mission? And here you would be wondering, discovering God's mission among the people of other cultures. It is true, all of us begin to think from the standpoint of where we are and think others are existing over there. Now guess what? Who will be the others for me if I would stand in India? <laughs> that would be the Europeans and North Americans. And exactly that's what we are going to do. The impact of Indians and Indian Christianity are mission work in India on Europe and North America. We will visit Germany, Scandinavian countries, and we will come back to the uh, United Kingdom, particularly England, then we will visit Boston, we come to Philadelphia, and we go back to Boston, and there we will end, and see what, what it tells. What does these, all these connections have to do with um, mission work? Again, uh, some introductory remarks. What are some of the basic principles? God is the creator of all human beings, no matter who they are, where they are, in what situation they are. Because in the part of my society where I grew up, when we go back, we will see the society, may, people may think it is 200 years backwards. They don't think of themselves like that. They think current, modern, and as ever they were. So the comparisons do not yield good results. They are authentically who they are. But God created them. God is active in all human cultures. The second principle, something that we saw also in the previous one, Christians are not the ones to introduce God to anybody. There is God's knowledge everywhere available. They are only building on what is available. Thirdly, all human cultures have noble and ignoble histories, memories, and elements. No culture is romantic. And there is joy and there is pain. Only it takes time to reveal these aspects. But how do we as Christians major on good things, things that sponsor and foster life to become more humane? That is a big event. All cultures should come under the Lordship of Christ. That is our desire. Ultimately, Jesus being, Jesus Christ being the Lord. They say the Lord, it is not the English word Lord, again, that anybody can become a Lord. They can earn the Lordship. It's not that. It's the Lord, Lord of Jesus Christ, the one person who controls and who loves and who makes love as a credential for his lordship. And the word of God is the primary means of making it, the spiritual and social change of individuals and societies. It is not technology, it is not strategies. They are all part of it, 
but it is primarily God's word, a seed that creates the change. And how far we authentically share God's word with people, that is a big thing. It is not uh, uh, establishing branches of one's work, but rather trying to introduce the people to engage with God's word in the air situation. That creates life a new meaning. The church is vital in this event, not because we have chosen it, it is God's way of doing things. That, so God's word and the church, and then you see that I put it small letter, because if I would write it big, then there are a lot of theological debates. But church is the place where people love the Lord Jesus Christ and serve him in whatever capacity that is possible at that time in a given area. And the churches do not have to all the time carry European histories, European memories, and perpetuate them anywhere else. There can be new attempts without carrying the European baggage all the time with them. And the last one is the basic principle is like-minded friends can transcend boundaries. Where bureaucrats will be able to see only limits, friends who trust one another, they can jump over the wall if they need to be. In German, there is a proverb, mit ihm kann man Pferde klauen. One can steal the horse with him. That's how they say total dependence. And friends can do that. So uh, the examples that I am going to share with you is all based on friendships. Friends who saw a different way of life when kings and some of the ecclesial leaders and theologians saw hurdles. But friends were spring over. And so we will go in a geographical manner. We begin with India, South India, but go to Germany and Scandinavian countries, come to England, and from England then we will, we will slowly move to east coast of United States where we are. So the first, the origin of Trunk Bar Mission, where do they have that origin? It is, again, it's a German Lutherans that you can see. Philipp Jakob Spener, the counselor of Germany, that's how he, that was his nickname because he, could, he knew the marriage relationships of almost all the ruling princes, and nobody could fool him around. So, <laughs> so he knew them with, through and through, very well placed. Spainer, August Hermann Franke, one of his disciples, he began to implement some of the teachings that he did, and, and his colleagues. Again, very close friendships. Demonstration of faith in words and action. That is the key motto. If somebody tells you believe in God, okay, show it in action. And Bible-centered theological education, not merely in universities, but also at homes and in public places and giving them opportunities to practice that faith. It is part of the reform program and Royal Danish Household in crisis at one time, 1705. The king and, the, and the, his behavior was so upsetting the people, and his court preacher and his mother and his wife came up with a brilliant idea of starting a foreign mission. That's how, not because of somebody was very pious, but God used that opportunity, very profane opportunity, to create something totally new. Very unexpected at that time. But here are some of the key friends. The friend was Lutkens in Copenhagen, that was the court preacher, who already worked in Berlin for 17 years. And he knew the pietistic circles very well. Then Joachim Lange, a school headmaster. And August Hermann Franke, great pedagogian and Anton Wilhelm Böhme and Henry Newman in London. Böhme is a very interesting character. He was a Lutheran. He came to minister to the husband of Queen Anne. I will come later on. Queen Anne was an Anglican. Once he accepted the sacrament from an Anglican priest, that was enough 
to create a big mess at, in those days in, in the palace of James. So he had to go and bring a Lutheran pastor to serve Holy Communion to him. So it was in that kind of situation, ecumenism is born. <laughs> we will see it because these experiences that people had, they used it through the friendships to bridge gaps. And Newman was a Bostonian, studied in Harvard, along with the Cotton Mather, and became the secretary to SPCK for a very, very long time. And he was, so to say, the bridge between uh, the Puritans and the Anglicans in those days. All friendships. And here is Trankubar, a very recent picture, not from me as you can tell, it's an aerial picture. And you can see the sea is encroaching as I was telling you earlier. And here is the Zion Church. And when we come, this is the cross-shaped Lutheran Church. It's the one street, it's a Danish colony where most of these actions would take place. This is so to say the mother church of all Protestant churches in India. It, was, it, is, it has the date, 1718, you can see Friedrich IV as the, the, the king, but it was originally founded in a different place in 1707. And later on, it became, uh, it is still there, that walls are six foot thick to withstand tsunami. Tsunami hit and destroyed the first one, but this church again withstood. So that was from 1706. What happens? The impact on the Lutherans in Germany and Scandinavia. See, they were the ones who were sending, but now they are the recipients. What did they receive? And they were willing to receive. The first one is literature. What you see here on this picture, on this right side, is the first Protestant missionary journal in, uh, written in German, and particularly for the, for the Lutherans and Protestants. What does it say? It is very curious when the noteworthy reports, that, was, that is the word with Merkwürdige Nachricht. And what is that report is about? And it is about here, zum löblichen Versuch, for a noble attempt. Even when the missionaries went out, they were not convinced that the Indians would embrace Christian faith. Because the reports that they received for, had received already from the colonial people were telling you cannot reach them. It is very difficult. So I said, okay, let us make an attempt. The result may, will be very different. Let us make an attempt. So this is the first one. What does it do? It provides literature about people of other cultures. When Europeans began to read it, they are warming up. Somebody found good business, journalism. And originally they were doubting, should we print missionary reports about India? Don't we become impoverished? But by the contrast, August Hermann Franke was the one, the great leader who had that you know, hesitation. But slowly he overcomes because people begin to read and give money. And by receiving the money, he gets more encouraged. And it's a pub very good publicity for, their, for his own organization, the Franca Foundations. They are still existing. And above all, this information educates people cross-culturally, particularly young children. I will tell later on, one of the persons who gained that uh, prayerful participation of giving and praying for one another, what he will do. I will come back to that very, 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 uh, very soon. Then over a 70 year period, these Haller reports were bundled together in nine volumes. As you can see, they are going up to the, the starting point of German enlightenment. When German enlightenment people came, they thought we are the superior people. By very neatly telling you how to leave the people as they are, they were telling don't interfere into anything else, don't give them any alternate way of thinking and thought, let them be as, as they are. Because they believed we, the rationalism did not permit them to present the gospel of Christ and they interpreted it as imposition. Well, the mission began to decline and missionaries be, did not come forward 
at from that point onwards. But that is a very good turning point. See, the Pittsburgh Theological Seminary did not start, start uh, started, we must say, very soon afterwards. It's only uh, 30, uh, 94, isn't it? Very soon. There were other attempts. But in the continental Europe, things began to be very, very different. But as long as it existed, it provided an opportunity for cross-cultural learning. What else? This is the missionary work that impacted the Moravians like no other thing. I'm, I know you, you would be knowing the Moravians, our Brudergemeinde, our brethren from Germany, Count Nicholas Zinzendorf. Perhaps I'm sure that many of you would know his, the famous phrase, this much you have done, I have done for you, what have you done for me? That is the question that he would ask and dedicate himself. This goes far beyond before that time. When he was a young person and sitting in the lap of his grandmother in Berlin, what would she read to him? The stories from India. That story is not known to the people. So Zinzendorf heard from his boyhood stories about India and missionary enterprise. So what was in, invested in that child at that time did not go uh, wasted. Then when he grew up, you see, he, he went to the for schooling, Franca Foundation, where there was a school for the elite princes. They paid heavy money and they subsidized the fee for other students. Maybe a handful of students paid the fee for another 2,000 students like that, but he was one of them. But turning points in his life is meeting with these two people, Johann Ernst Grundler and Siegenbalk, whom he mentions as the apostle of, from India. And it is the stories and the personal encounter with them changes him so drastically that from 1732 onwards, he would approach the kingdom and the king of Denmark, at that time the son of Friedrich IV, and ask for sending missionaries. Where did they send earlier ones? The earlier ones <laughs> go to Lapland, Greenland, and these were the areas where the first Moravians were active, and they, they go there. I do not have time, otherwise I would explain. Again, there are stories and persons behind these movements. Basel Mission in Switzerland, and Leipzig Evangelical Lutheran Mission, all of them have inseparable contact with the Trankabar Mission. They learned from both from the merits and demerits of that mission over a period of time. So this, the ba ba Basel Mission still exists, Leipzig Mission still exists, and they in turn have impacted other mission agencies and churches in Turingen and also Sachsen-Anhalt in different parts of Germany and Switzerland. So the legacy that started in Trankubad, in a very small place in South India, and the stories of Indians, very ordinary people who dared to become and to embrace Christian faith, continues in a way. Now, slow, slowly, we will see the ordination of a man of the first Lutheran pastor, Aaron, or Aaron. It's a symbolic name. His original name was Armugam Pillai. See, his father was a merchant. And in dealing with the English East India Company, he became bankrupt. And he absconded. But his, the son goes to a school. It was conducted by a catechist. And the catechist tells him about Christ, and then he embraces Christian faith, goes to Ziegenbalk, and gets baptized. And they give him the symbolic name Aaron after the, uh, after the brother of Moses. Very, very symbolic name. Who knew at that time that he would be the first pastor of Tamil? So let the people choose their own leaders. But I will come back to it. His ordination was not so very simple. The impulse, one of the impulses came from Boston. I will show some pictures when we come to East Coast at that time. But these are the various pictures. You will see many of them printed in different forms just to encourage 
German Lutheran pastors to rethink about their vocation and how they would think about people from other cultural backgrounds. They could each other accept one another as equal, but he looked different, he spoke a different language, and he moved among different people, and was he an equal person? And again, I, I mentioned to you a person who was growing up as giving and praying. He was the one who would intercede for him later on, Daniel Conrad Kleinknecht, I will show later on. But his ordination was an enormous impact. How? This Conrad Daniel Kleinknecht, that is his name, it is from the Google books, as you can see, tells, tells him the example of Aaron touched Pastor Conrad Daniel Kleinknecht, and he asked his reader in Germany to think about the sheep and the lamb of the newly converted Tamil heathens who are poor and needy members of the body of Christ. That is this title. Friends, for them, the body of Christ was big was bigger than their own denominations. And they knew embracing Christian faith would lead many, many Indians out of their kinship. Because loyalties to their ancestral faith was very important. When they choose to go differently, then it was not easy. So that was the reason many of them became economically poor. And Conrad Kleinknecht tells, we as a body of Christ have the obligation to assist and to help. And that you see, that was in the year 17, no, seven, no, the, no that's it, sorry, I was too fast. 1738, 1738. But the arguments that were surrounding about Aaron and the pastor, his ordination did not stop. And it continued. So in the year 1749, he had to write another book, but use a different picture. And he is the pastor, he is holding his Bible in the hand, and he is, he is preaching. Again, it is, it's a very long book, about 700 pages, and he had to write this book as a pastor for the pastors, not for the congregation people. It is sometimes easier to convince the congregation than the leaders. Because most of the leaders are afraid that the, the money would go to somewhere else, not to, the, not to their own congregation, but it will go to a different category, different, the destination would be different. So they were afraid. But here he was telling, you do not have to be afraid. Because the mission magazines are the information that gives, expands your horizon and proves how God helps independent of political structures. Earlier they believed only European political structures have to somehow help the growth of church. The Danish church was there, but the people who lived there were all mostly Indians. There were only 24 Danes for 6,000 Indians. So it's a drop in the bucket. So it was, a, in, a, in a way, kind of Indian enterprise. So he tells them it can grow because the gospel is alive. If it grows in India, it can also grow in Germany. That was the, that was the implication. Now, from Germany, we will move to England and see how certain few English people began to get the uh, importance of missionary thinking. I do not say this is the beginning of missionary enterprise, no. English people had a longer history because they had SPCK, a Society for Promoting Christian Knowledge, and few other enterprise already. Because Society for Promoting Christian Gospel, they had already sent missionaries to New England. But to a large extent, they did not know how to do it well. They sent people to preach and to teach in the school, gave books, but they did not know how to do it at the ground level in a systematic way over a long period of time. And for that, they had to learn from, from the Trunkbar mission. 
there were again two friends who made it possible. Not the church hierarchy, no archbishop ever went and asked how should we do. It's an ordinary people who went, the first man is Ludolf. So Heinrich Wilhelm Ludolf, a secretary to the king of uh, the Prince George of Denmark, who was the husband of Queen Anne. And he uh, gave up his job, went to Russia to think about how to unite Orthodox Church with, uh, with the European churches and what can unite them together, became so enthusiastic, traveled through Halle and came to know the pietists and comes back to England and introduces them to the people in power. And out of that conversation comes Anton Wilhelm Böhme, a student of August Hermann Franke, who knew Ziegenbalk, who knew people who were associated with missionary enterprise, a good man, and who was gifted in languages. So what does he do? He wants to broaden the minds of the readers of SPCK, Society for, Create, uh, Society for Promoting Christian Knowledge. And he is a member of that group and then translates the information that was printed in Germany into English. And then he gives the title, Propagation of the Gospel in the East. And then this would run into many editions. And this is the book. It's a very small booklet. It is available online nowadays, thank God. <laughs> I, <laughs> I used to run out and book it. Like no other book that played a part in, in promoting mission consciousness among the English-speaking people. So in England, a lot of people read this story and were enthused. Again, if, if God's gospel, the gospel of Christ could be embraced by people whose culture spans over 2,000 years, it is possible for Americans or for Europeans too. That was the motivation behind it. And what does Anton Wilhelm Burma do? See, if you read this, if you have an opportunity later on to download this and read this book, he, he begins with the particular paragraph where he tells Europeans have failed to protect Constantinople from its fall, 1453. If Europe is not careful, that would all follow the same way. But what will prevent it is your engagement overseas. So do not be so much inward looking people, look out. If you are going to look too much inward, you are going to find not so many blessings all the time because you are going to find sore spots, lot of problems. If there are no problems, they will create problems. So it's better that you see beyond yourself, and then he tells India, possibly, and then the missionaries as examples. So that's what I, uh, I, have, I have put that word. So this, this, but it's so small. I, mm, yeah, there. That he tells Chagan Balk and others, they should be the examples for missionary work if ever England begins to send out missionaries. Let them follow. Well, it took many, many more decades before English missionaries went out. I will share some of the details later on. But what did they publish? This is a German one. So they, here you see the letters. It, it all looks like scribblings. This is the antidote to Greek and Latin. They were, they were thinking European mind has spent too much time in grappling with Aristotle, Socrates, and Cicero, and P Seneca. Now it is a good time for them to go beyond. There is culture equally ancient, equally complex, and equally brilliant in promoting intellectual pursuit why don't you go? 
and these are the scripts and they are the written culture they were telling. So what they were telling is they were promoting alternative way of intellectual inquiry. So do not simply think about people as ignorant, as heathen, before you get to know them better. And that he will reproduce in England. Think about England. They had, by that time, 100 year of colonial enterprise. 1602, they sent their first people to India. But here, they are grappling with ordinary life, authentic information, and then find it very interesting. So what is the result? The propagation of the gospel runs in so many editions, up to 17, 18, three times it were into three different volumes it will go. By the time it, it runs out in 17, 18, it has already impacted many minds, both in, English, in the English-speaking world in England and in Boston. <laughs> when they say India, East India, the, the whole is East India. See, it, it begins from Arabia onwards, or it's all East Indies. That's why it has a map of East Indies. It's not merely India alone, as we think of today. It's very, very interesting the way how they in, uh, imagine their geography. Now, we are still in England. Impact on the Wesleys. See, sometimes when people are sick, isn't it? This is what happens. They begin to want to read light literature. And Wesley's mother happened to read the propagation of the gospel in the East. How does he read? And then in one of the sermons, John Wesley confides it himself. In the funeral speech to his mother, he tells what happened. And this is a story, it's a well-known story for the Methodists, but may not be for us in our, in our context. So this is the mother's writing that I would, I would like to quote. In spite of weakness and weariness, the mother struggled on, and in proportion as her family little comforts in the world decreased, her anxiety for the happiness in the future state grew and strengthened. And in one time when she was very sick, then she asks the daughter, please go and bring something to read. So the daughter goes into the father's bookshelves, and then this is what she writes. I'll, again, I'll quote. Soon after you went to London, Emilia found in your study the account of the Danish missionaries, which, have, which having never seen, I desired her to read to me. I was never, I think, more affected with anything than with the relation of their travels and was exceedingly pleased with the noble design that they were engaged in. Their labors refreshed my soul beyond measures, and I could not forbear spending a good part of that evening in praising and adoring the divine goodness for inspiring those good men with such ardent zeal for his glory. For some days I could not think and speak a little of little else. It then came to into my mind, though I am not a man, nor a minister of the gospel, yet if I were inspired with the true zeal for his glory, then really I desired the salvation of souls, I might do it more than I do. I thought I might live in a more exemplary manner, I might pray more for the people and speak with more warmth to those with whom I have opportunity conversing. However, I resolved to begin with my own children, and accordingly I proposed and observed the following method. I take such proportion of time as I can best spare every night to, discur to dis discourse with each child by itself on something that relates to its principal concerns. On Monday, I talk with Molly. On Tuesday, with Hetty. Wednesday, with Nancy. Thursday with Jackie, Friday with Patty, Saturday with Charles, and with Emily, Sarki, together on Sunday. <laughs> See what that reading did to the Wesleys. And the mother being the missionary to her own children. Amazing testimony. 
this particular event will, will sink in to the minds of the Methodists. So when the first pro Methodist man who wanted to go as a missionary was Dr. Thomas Koch. He was in the United States. Then he goes back to Liverpool and asks the Methodists, please send me. They are telling you are too old, you won't make it. Finally, he makes his own money, 6,000 pounds in those days, but on the way he died in the sea, so he could never reach. But before that, he wrote to the Lutherans for opinion, Christian Friedrich Schwartz. But well, he died, but his follower, that was James Lynch, he reached. As you can see, 1813, and where does he go first? Go to Trankubar. Until he remembers all the stories that I was reading about Susanna Wesley, and they believe they are treading the footprints of the Lutherans. See, in the, here in the Western context, they cannot say that. But in a faraway place, they were able to manage to say and slowly begin their, their work. So the impact of James, the, Method, the Trankabar mission on the Methodist England is, is big. Now slowly we will, we will move to another story and this time we come to New England, Boston. And in Boston, we are very much connected to Cotton Mather. I'm sure you know about his association with Harvard University and his role in Boston, great Puritan leader. But where does he get his ideas about missionary work? And that we will see through his friend, Henry Newman, who was not merely a Puritan, but also a very staunch Anglican at that time. And he would send to Cotton Mather and put them in touch. So Cotton Mather wrote to, are you able to see this one, are you, is it clear? Yeah, it is again, it, this booklet is available online, so we can see India, India Christiana, 1721, and that, that, that's what he, he writes about, what, the report of your mission and of your engagements everywhere, it's, it comes like a cool water, see? Cool waters to our thirsty soul is the good news from a far country. That is the missionary report. So when Cotton Mather says something, it has weight. And people begin to listen. And by the way, he wrote to the missionaries in India, particularly to Tsigenbalk, but Tsigenbalk by that time passed away. He could not respond to him. So his colleague responded the following one. It's very interesting. I hope you are able to read. That which I now desire is, it is from the Indian message coming back to Boston. That which I now desire is that the correspondence by letters which you have begun with us may, may be still kindly continued so that the East may talk with the West and the West may manifest unto the East its desires and the works of God, A, that they may, be, may stir up each other in the, so in, the cause, in the course of the gospel, quicken each other with their prayers, push on each other in the way to heaven, give to each other the admonitions of patience, and confirm each other to the hope that is our life. I thought East and West must meet in the Christian gospel. And then that you see, that is so early, 1717, 1718. Now, Cotton Mather has gone from the scene for this particular part, but other legacies continue. Now the correspondence has been established, and now what is going to impact the ordination of the pastor? That is John Eliot. And John Eliot's dealing with the local Indian, that is the local American population, the Native Americans. The, the <coughs> Waban people in, in Natick. So this particular spot is in Newton. Sharon, Dr. Sharon Taylor knows that very well. And I'm sure 
Bishop Darcy knows that very well too. So I used to take my students to that spot and then say, this is the origin of a big movement in world history. And you need to know. And John Eliot, and John Eliot's story was very important. This is still the symbol of Newton, where John, John Eliot is preaching to the uh, local people. It is the state symbol of the city of Newton, city of Newton. But what does it have to do with India? This is this message on the top. See, in 1729, they received an information from Boston, a person who was living in Martha's Vineyard, that is at Cape Cod, Martha's Vineyard, writing in English about the ordination of local native pastors. He would have never thought that Indians, it would be read in India, and the Indians would make a claim. If the people in the United States could, at the, in those days there was no United States as such as we know of today, but in the New England we were able to ordain a local person to lead the church, why not we? This is, by the way, one of the 129 arguments they put for ordination. <laughs> it's a big, thick writing, why they should ordain a people. But nowadays we take it for granted, but not in the former times. Lot of debates went into it, and one of, this, one of the movements was from the, for, from the United States. And this is the church in Natick, in Wellesley, just beyond Natick, when we go, we can see this one Indian meeting house. And Aaron, he was ordained in 1733, after much, much debate. And this particular ordination is still, the work that they started still continues. Now we come to Philadelphia, where we are. You may wonder, what is that relationship? How did the Trankabar mission affect our influence, Lutherans in Philadelphia, particularly Georgetown and places like that. It is through this man, so Henry Melchior Muhlenberg. Muhlenberg was a student in Halle. See, you can notice his dates when he was there around the 1760s, when the heyday of the mission. So he has seen most of the great missionary work. And by that time, Salzburg, a Catholic place, asks a lot of Reformed Christians and the Lutherans to leave the territory. So they are all known as Salzburg emigrants. Salzburg emigrants, for a time being, they go to Zinzendorf place, and they could not leave for a long time, and they are looking for a new place to come, and where do they come? They come to Pennsylvania. And it, is, it was, Melchior was their leader. And he is known as the patriarch of Lutherans in the United States. Held very high respect. I was told from his congregation, some of the leading American politicians also went, uh, uh, went ahead. So, Melchior, and then his memorial is in front of the Philadelphia Lutheran Seminary. In, in, uh, in uh, play, no, that's it. Now we are coming slowly to the end, end of the 18th century. The influence that did not stop. Here I am showing you a an, an, um, document, Defense of Mission in India, which has influenced a lot. It's a very small, thin paper. And the man behind it is Christian Friedrich Schwartz. Whose, whose lifestyle has changed South India forever, forever, so to say. An English diplomat goes and accompanies him, as many dignitaries go and see what the missionaries are doing. So what this man does, he comes to the English parliament in 1793, that is one year before the Pittsburgh Seminary was founded, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> and that in the parliament, they debate. Part of the debate was, is it really worthwhile to send out missionaries for the sake of conversion? By the way, they did not use the word conversion so very much. 
in the modern sense of the word. Embracing Christian faith would be the more appropriate term, even though they use the word bekehrung or conversion in their literature. So the British Parliament debated, and the, and the, the honesty and integrity of this man was in game. They wanted to discredit the name. You know who wrote the recommendation letter for, Cornwall, uh, for Schwartz? It was Cornwallis. Cornwallis, after he surrendered the United States here, and the United States came into existence, English East India Company sends him to Calcutta. And then he makes visits to different parts of India. And then in one part, they, he came to know about Schwartz. So before the SPCK published this material, they asked him, let us ask Cornwallis what he tells. Mm -hmm. Cornwallis tells he is a man of integrity. Mm -hmm. With that side note, they publish it. So from this point onwards, from 1794, this document would be quoted almost verbatim for the defense of mission. It's a fantastic document. It tells if you are honest Christian, you are going to be a blessing to the people. Never a curse. Never a curse. That is so to say the summary of it, but his impact is even further. See, he, Charles Grant was the chief of the directors of East India Company. A friend of Wilberforce, you know the dignitaries' names over there, Clapham sect, and what they will do to end slavery and bring in a lot of reform in prison and local people. Again, Schwartz was the one who reminded Charles Grant, now you are going back to England in 1792. Remember why God places you there. And he was the one who would open English territories for missionary activity, along with Wilberforce and many, many others, against the dismay of many politicians because they, they believed the missionaries would be the people who spent so much money and the company would not be able to make enough money to make up. But they would, they would overrule. And one of the outcome was, see, 17, yeah, 1793, they put the pious clause, send missionaries, and the English East India Company rejects. So what do they do? They start London Missionary Society. All lay people event. It is not a clergy movement, lay people movement. So London Missionary Society came into existence. And what else? The Church Missionary Society is the church movement. It is the Anglican Church. That played, an, played a role in it, 1799. Not, not, more than, not, not only that, in 1804, Bible Society will come into existence. Again through their enterprise. And above all, in 1813 and 1833, the pious class would be introduced where Anglican bishoprics could be established, legally established, in, in Calcutta, in Bombay, in Madras, and in many other places. A revolution would take place. See, from 1833 onwards, American missionaries were also allowed. The Andover missionaries, Andover Newton Theological School, their graduates came 1812. They were not allowed directly. That's how Adoniram Judson had to go to uh, Myanmar, Burma. But from 1833 onwards, American missionaries would come. And whose life story they are choosing for to be an example? It is Christian Friedrich Schwartz. As you can see, the title page adores his, his word. And this particular biography is based on an English biography 1834, but it's a little adapted. Spellings are adapted, but it's printed in, in New York. And what do they write? And you see it is placed on Boston, May 1835, to, to give the emerging congregational and Baptist missionary attempts the, the backbone. They say, we recognize on every page the footsteps of a noble-minded disciple and apostle of Jesus. His example will shine gloriously through all coming generation, but very few missionaries, if any, will be called to perform political duties such as were entrusted to him. 
but all may well copy his wisdom, his fervency, his unite, untiring industry, his bland and affectionate disposition, his comprehensive views for the best good of mankind, and his habitual and cordial trust in the merits and the mediation of the Savior. This memoir, and then it goes on saying that. So again, what happened in a faraway place would move. So now you understand, when we think about people of other cultures, I have not spoken about its impact in Africa or in other places, but primarily continental Europe and British Island, British Isles, and East Coast of United States. And there are many more examples like that. Nobody would have ever imagined when they began that their story would have such wide impact. And it is an encouragement for all of us to, to see that the, the impact still continues. And this is one of the videos, that a documentary film that is made very recently in February, based on one of my books on Chicken Balk, the bi biographies. It is available, it's not a sales promotion or anything. It, uh, Christopher Gilbert may, uh, does everything, but his contact details are available. But the, the trailers are available online, you can see. So what began 300 years ago as among the missionary people, as friends, still continues. These are some of my concluding remarks. God the Creator is active in all human cultures and works towards bringing them under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. In this mission, God uses God's Word, the Church, and God's people in cross-cultural contexts. Like-minded Christian friends can shape these contexts. They learn to transcend boundaries created by human beings and participate in God's mission in, in God's world among God's people. Thank you for your attention. Dr. J. Raj, thank you for that. I, I'm a practitioner and I think like a practitioner and so I naturally think of implications for ministry and I think of the, the impact of these missionary reports on the German Lutherans and you said that these missionary reports became a means of uh, cross-cultural learning. And I think about my own church and I think about the fact that we are partnered with missionaries now, and we, re we receive their reports, and we often see them as a way of supporting them and knowing how to pray for them, but we don't often see them as a means of discipleship for our congregation. And I even think of uh, the missionaries we, we support and where they're from, and I think of the fact that some of the largest demographic groups in the neighborhood where I serve it, are Russian and Korean and Chinese, and we don't support any missionaries or are partnered with any missionaries serving in those parts of the world, and I wonder how my church might be better equipped cross-culturally uh, if we were to be partnered with missionaries in those parts of the world? Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> and it is, <laughs> we cannot prescribe certain ways, but there are certain, certain principles that we try to follow. F learning from this particular story, what they do as a preliminary step, learn the language. Mm -hmm. And um, most of the time we tend to believe that my language they should speak my language uh, in English or any other, any other, German for that matter. The learning would come, will follow. Mm. And the language learning is, is a tough job. But the only way that we can learn is by interacting with the people. Not in uh, overseas, but people who live in our neighborhood. That's right. So most of the time, we all love going to restaurants run by people from other parts of the world. And then we enjoy their food in their restaurants. Mm -hmm. But do we give them an opportunity to enjoy our food in our homes? Mm -hmm. Or in our churches? How many of us have invited the restaurant people, come let's to the church, we are offering a good meal, come and join us. So these may be some of the starting points in our locally, mm -hmm. and then slowly it will go. And just one more thing, as a discipleship for growth, the early reports came and they were f telling them how good Indians were. 
morally superior and intellectually beyond reproach sometimes to the Europeans because most of the Europeans who went there were uneducated people and they were not permitted to take their wives. Then you can see when they are so far away for a long, distance, a long period of time what they would do. So Christianity meant immorality over there. So a lot of people did not want to become Christians until these people came to in touch with missionaries and then people mingling with them. It begins with the missionary sitting down with the school children on the floor learning to write. So to that level of learning capacity they should bring. So good things and also we are concerned about bringing Christ to them and that will follow. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Could you comment a little bit about the role of understanding one's own cultural and ethnic identity plays? Just last week I was having a conversation with another guy who was white and his word to me was, I'm a white suburban, I don't have an ethnic identity. Mm. And, 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 that is his identity. And you know, I, 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 I disagreed with him, but I also think his comment is one that a lot of us hold. We, we think of being white as the absence of an ethnic identity or the absence of a cultural heritage. Yeah, very good. Uh, it, it, is a, it is again a, a deep question. I would come to know better if I come to know my neighbor better. So if I am isolated, I do not have any point of reference. But the more we come to know people who do not think like me, who do not speak like me, who do not act like me, the better it would be for me to, to understand myself. The missionary reports were doing the same thing. They were describing what people in India achieved independent of the word of God through their natural instincts or through their scriptural understandings and it is a challenge to the local people in Germany for example readers they would the missionaries would say the Indians put us to shame in many aspects in their religiosity spirituality and ethical behavior pattern whom they knew at that time in comparison to the Europeans with whom they were dealing with. So these are some of the ways. So getting to know people, others, mm -hmm. then we will know who we are. So beginning by understanding that there are other cultural backgrounds and sure. ideas. Yeah. Surely. I, I, I asked you this yesterday and you asked me to ask it again on stage. Sure. So I'm going to. I, Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. I, I read the propagation of the gospel in the East and the, the reports of these Danish missionaries uh, in uh, Trankabar. Right. And one of the, the, the climaxes of the story was uh, the missionaries' efforts and the church's attempt um, and successful attempt to get a printing press uh, there to uh, print Bibles. And in our age, uh, we are very skeptical of imposing our own culture and our own cultural goods on other cultures. And so I wondered, is that the best way? Why not allow the scriptures to continue to be copied by hand as other literature in India was being copied by hand? Mm -hmm. It is an amazing question too. Why not allow the people as they are? Well, here is the crux. The, we asked the same question in 2006. You will see that in that DVD that I just um, presented to you a little bit, Beyond the Empires. There, the chairperson of Indian Printing Association would give the testimony. Without that printing press in India, knowledge dissemination would have been very, very limited. Languages would not have been standardized because they have to fit into the uh, printing mold. Thirdly, people would not have had an opportunity to read literature written by other people. So whether it is the Bible or Christian songs or systematic theology that was translated, it became a discussion partner for them. So the printing press made it possible. Thirdly, it took away the stigma for a long time re with reference to paper. Because most Indians believed at that time the paper was made with cow fat 
hard lard. <laughs> so even mere touching that one will make a person ritually polluted. So they did not want to touch. So what did the people do? They asked, they made paper then and there in their own presence. They had their paper manufacturing mill for some time. It didn't work for a long time, but they did. So local people could come and see how they make paper. Mm -hmm. So these are all uh, changes in attitudes. So ordinarily they won't be possible. And the printing press, and, and not only printing press, they also brought in standing clock, the big pendulum clocks. Microscopes, globe, and um, mathematical instruments, they taught them over there. And it is simply to tell you can assess sciences yourself. You do not have to depend on only the priestly class and pay them money and you be impoverished. So you can be your own. So these were all the things. Yeah. So whoever loses financial income, they would say it's a destruction. Mm. Mm. The same thing also, a Western form of calendar. The Gregorian calendar was introduced too. Mm. So again they felt they, they, there is no need for them to go and ask the priests, what is the good time, auspicious time, inauspicious time. So it's all uh, revolutions that slowly happened. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you for well, asking that. Absolutely. Uh, I know I'm not the only one who has questions for yeah. Dr. J. Raj, and so we'd like to turn it over to every, anyone else who would like to ask a question. I see Ben's hand raised. Thanks for this brilliant question. So what promotes human life and makes it better is good. And what hinders it is not. That is the criteria. Women education, take for example. So nowadays people admire Bharatanatyam, isn't it? Indian dance. A lot of people go to that big show. Originally, in some circles, not everywhere, Devadasis performed their dances. Devadasis are literally, it means servants of deities. Once they are servants of deities, they were not allowed to marry anybody else. They were called Nitya Sumangali, eternally blessed people. But in, in reality, it was a big exploitation of women. So anybody who could read and write and sing, they were the Devadasis, because they had to read and sing the stories that they have to enact in temples or in major festivals. Now start a school and ask them to come and read or to sing Christian hymns. What will Im people immediately think? Hey, she has become a Devadasi person. Mm. That's what happened. So in 1707, when the first girls' school was started, Christians sent and withdrew because the social pressure was so harsh. But after a few years, that is by 1715, they, it was recognized, had to be pushed hard. Now you see there are more Indian women more brilliant than men. <laughs> In the annual exams, mostly it is the women who back the prizes, not boys or young men. They do brilliantly well. But it took 300 years. So in the beginning, people said, you are destroying our cultural habits. But slowly, slowly it turned out. Like that, there are many other. Introducing agriculture, cattle breeding, and uh, employment possibilities, a lot of other things people would say. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions for Dr. Jai Raj? Yeah. Yes. I have a question. On the other hand, what were some of the positive connecting points in Hindu and in, in India with Christianity? 
Oh, there are a lot. Yeah. You are asking a question that I have been studying, still studying for 22 years. <laughs> I don't think that I will be able to finish it during my lifetime. Lot. There is the, 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 what you call in Greek, pistis. What is that translated? Faith. Faith. But again, see here we are all dealing with foreign languages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we insert our own meaning into it. So bhakti is the, another term for pistis. And when they translated that word pistis, it is all the time it is bhakti. Bhakti in Tamil too. Because that word captures the essence of pistis. That is not possible in any other European language. What does it do? It's the loving devotion to a God whom you have chosen to worship. So in all European languages it has to be descriptive. So it is a, that level of uh, identification and in the morning I was telling vocabulary, Christian vocabulary. Lot of things are associated with already existing vocabulary that was there. And relationships, how do you form relationships? Lot of things learned, were learned from the existing cultural backgrounds. Family affections, so loyalties, loyalties to one's cultural habits over a long period of time, they are all there. The desire to memorize things, to recite what the Greeks would call arete, mm -hmm. you know, demonstrating knowledge in public. I, the Indians would do a lot, a lot better, and Christians would do too. Thank you. So I there are a lot of connections. <laughs> I think we are at the end of our time. Would you please join me in thanking again Dr. Daniel J. Raj. Thank you.